So I'm Sherilyn Parsons, the festival's founder and director, and we are delighted to welcome Leila Slimani. If I get your name right, and yes, last. yes, yes, absolutely, yes. And um, one question that um, occurred to me is, um, you know, we met at the Jaipur Literature Festival. I thought you stole the show at that festival. It was fantastic, and I just knew immediately I wanted to try to bring you to Berkeley. So we're so fortunate that you were coming here. And um, I've read a couple interviews of you, and obviously heard you at Jaipur. You um, wear a lot of hats. You are a writer, which is a very private kind of experience, you and the page. You're now a public figure. And of course, you're a mother, and a wife, and a daughter. And especially the public figure part has really um, come upon you, it seems, relatively quickly. I mean, from being a writer and a mother to suddenly people like me are asking you questions, <laughs> and you're being interviewed on news and so on. How have you stayed grounded? Uh, probably thanks to my mother and my children, because I'm a daughter and because I'm a mother. Mm -hmm. Because uh, even if you're a celebrity, even if people uh, know you in the street, you always come home with a son telling you, Mommy, I need this, and Mommy, I need that. And he doesn't care if you write books or uh, are very famous or everyone loves you mm -hmm. because he just needs this. Uh -huh. So, you know, and my, my daughter, she, she wakes up at six anyway, if I'm I'm a celebrity or not. So I think it's very important to have children and to have my mother because my mother, I'm like, you know, mom, I'm in San Francisco and today I'm going to have an interview. And she's like, okay, okay. I want to tell you about, so she doesn't care. She just, <laughs> she's like, it's not interesting. You told me already about all your interviews and your uh -huh. books. So I have uh -huh. the, I'm very lucky to have my mother and my, my children. Yeah, yeah. And so is she help, she's helping to care. For, you have two young children yeah. now, right? So how is it being a I have a husband. I mean, yeah, I yeah. <laughs> yeah. He's useful. He's, he's yeah. useful. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Other times he goes away, you care for the children. Yes, yeah, yes, yeah. yes. He's useful. And you know, I, I told my mother, I'm going to leave for two weeks. I'm going to the United States. And she told me, you're going to leave your children alone? And I was like, no, they are with my husband. Yeah. They said, they are going to be alone. <laughs> <laughs> because yeah. for my mother, the, what is very important is a mother. A father is, OK. Yeah, he can stay at home, but mm -hmm. it's not the same. But mm -hmm. no, no, my husband is very useful and mm -hmm. he takes care of, the, of yeah. the children. Yeah, yeah. Do you enjoy the public figure aspect of this work? Um, I don't know if I enjoy, but I think it's important to be a professional. And when mm -hmm. you have success, when people read your book, when, you know, people are very nice to me. And when people ask me what has changed in your life since the Goncourt Prize and everything, mm -hmm. I always answer what changed is that I received a lot of love. Mm -hmm. No one can imagine how much love I received. And mm -hmm. m myself, I couldn't imagine that it was possible to receive so much love. So many people from so many cultures coming to you and telling you, thank you, thank you for what? Wow. Thank you just for telling a story. Thank you for telling feelings that I myself felt. So I'm very grateful for for this for receiving so much love because it's like you know uh, um like if i had a battery and my battery now is a hundred percent and i feel mm. very strong and i have the feeling that now whatever can happen i'm very strong and i can endure everything hmm. well that's wonderful um i think that writing a book is also an act of generosity um and uh you're delving deeply into yourself and applying all this craft to creating this this work. Um, what do you enjoy about the writing process? What does writing give to you? Why did you? Why do you do it? You know, it's very ambiguous because, as you said, it's a it's an act of generosity. But when you write, you don't write for someone. You don't write as an act of generosity. You you write in a in loneliness and you write for yourself. It's a really an act that you do in a sort of intimacy. Mm -hmm. You don't think about what the reader is going to think when he's going to read this uh, chapter or you just write for yourself and you need to write just for yourself to be completely free and not mm -hmm. to think of uh, what uh, the reader is going to think, how he's going to judge your characters. Mm -hmm. You need to write only for yourself. And then you meet the reader and another story is going to, to begin. But I think that when I write, what I like is to be totally lonely. And I like the, that, the fact of being totally focused. You know, you live with your character and you, mm -hmm. your character, he 
populates you. He he comes. You live with him. And I remember a story about Tolstoy. Mm -hmm. Tolstoy, when he wrote Anna Karenin, mm -hmm. his editor gave him a lot of money for to write Anna Karenin, and uh, he was waiting for the manuscript, waiting months and months and months. And one day he was really fed up with waiting, and he decided to take the train and to go to Tolstoy's house and to ask for the, the this F manuscript. <laughs> and so very rapidement, a tel qui a fait tel scandale à tel endroit, finalement ça se sait et tout. Il m'a dit ça va assez vite. So the author, yeah. Karenin left. I'm waiting for her. <laughs> and the editor was like, are you kidding me? Mm -hmm. And he was like, no, no, I'm not kidding you. And mm -hmm. you know, when I wrote this story the first time, I was like, oh, that's bullshit. No, that's not true. <laughs> but actually, when you write a book, that's totally true. Mm -hmm. You live with the character. He's with you and he's telling you what to write. Mm -hmm. It's there's something magical that you can't describe. It is impossible to, to tell exactly what you feel, but you live with someone with the feeling of someone and he's telling you his story and you just have to tell the story to others mm -hmm. and one day he disappears hmm. mm -hmm. so a lot of exchange you're talking about you with the characters the characters infusing you and then giving it to readers and then they're feeding you and of course they feel grateful that they've that they've read the book so it's a very solitary activity writing but in a way very much about yeah connection. but you know i think what is extraordinary and very weird is that the the relationship between the reader and the writer is too solitude that mm. that meets because when you read you're alone it's not like watching a movie when you read you're alone you're alone with your book and you're alone with your feeling maybe you will share uh, your feeling with me but what you felt exactly when you read the the book when you read the specific mm -hmm. word that I that I wrote is very lonely feeling mm -hmm. so it's too loneliness meeting mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's beautiful um, I want to give you an opportunity um, to take your loneliness and uh, <laughs> <laughs> ask a question from that. I don't want to hog uh, Layla up here. Um, does anyone have a question you want to ask for now? Yeah, F uh, Faiza. Uh, <coughs> Speak up. Questions. Yeah, yeah. Uh, two questions. Uh, number one, how long did it take you to write this novel? Was this a long process? Was the story change as you were writing? And number two, is there any other novelist that inspired you as you were writing this? It was funny because yesterday we went to see this Shakespeare play, Timon of Athens, that no one knows. And it turned out that uh, Nabokov's Pale Fire, uh, the term comes from Timon of Athens, and also Charles Dickens' Great Expectation took a lot of phrases from Timon of Athens. So did you have such kind of experience when you were reading other works or you know, watching? or reading you know, plays that you sort of took that and, and merged it in your writing? Uh, the idea of the book, I think that I had the, uh, this idea a long, long time ago, maybe uh, 2012, something like this. But I began to write some chapters and it was not good. It was very boring. Because what was very difficult, I found what, that was very difficult to write about an everyday life. The job of a nanny is very repetitive, very trivial, and it's very difficult to find a dynamic, a narrative dynamic for this story. And actually that's when I decided to put a violence, to put a murder in the book, that everything began for me. So when I had the <coughs> idea of the murder, maybe it took me one year to write the, the whole book. Uh, for the influence, it was very important for me to read, uh, because you have all uh, classical literature about domestics, especially in France. You have uh, Les Bonnes de Genet, you have another book called The Diary of, uh, of a Maid by Octave Mirbeau. And uh, uh, when you read those books, you discover that each time have a different way of describing domestics and the way domestic describes also their masters are different according to the different of, of times of uh, eras or so it's very interesting in the you have a, also a novel by Chekhov I don't know how it is in in English Récit d'un inconnu it's the the story of a maid too so um, uh, I read all those uh, all those books and it inspired me a lot because I wanted to give my own vision of what it is to be a maid or a nanny today. But a nanny is a very classical character, you know, even in the tragedy you always have a, a nanny somewhere. Nanny is very classical. Did you interview your own nanny? 
No, because I, um, <laughs> for me, no, but I asked her yeah. some question, yeah. but I, um, I didn't tell her, you know, I'm going to interview you and uh, mm -hmm. I'm going to use what you are going to tell. Yeah. I yeah. just wanted to look at her and to listen to her yeah. and to, to try to, uh, to understand what her yeah. life is. It was not the point of just telling her, okay, I'm going to ask you some question. Yeah. It yeah. was looking at her yeah. and trying to, to see her, really. Mm -hmm. And not just uh, consider her as the nanny and tell her what to do mm -hmm. and uh, when she comes and what she, uh, when she leaves. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Other question? No? Um, one of the things that it strikes me, and you've talked a lot about, um, speaking truth um, and sort of no matter what you will speak the truth um, regardless of sort of who's listening and my first question was just about sort of staying grounded among all these different roles and it occurred to me that maybe one way that you're able to do that is just by simply fully being yourself and like fully speaking your truth everywhere you go regardless of the setting and I'm wondering if you could comment on that if you find that to be the case or how you adjust different settings um you know actually for me it's impossible not to be myself i try to sometimes but i <laughs> don't succeed so um and it has always been like this when i was a little girl my parents would like just try please not to say what you think please <laughs> just one time try to adjust yes sometimes you need to be a hypocrite and i was like no i would never be a hypocrite mm -hmm. so i was always like this i always wanted to say what i think because i was living in a country morocco where you know, it's not like here, it's not like Western countries where people always tell you don't say exactly what you think and be careful. Mm -hmm. And uh, all, uh, and I was a, a girl, so I was. everyone was telling me not to do this and not to do that. And I was very, um, I had a lot of anger against this situation mm -hmm. and I wanted to fight and to say what I thought and I wanted to say the truth. Mm -hmm. And I remember when I was just a little girl, my, my father one day, he was, uh, very angry against me, I don't know why. And I answered him and he said, you don't answer your father. And I said, it's my mouth and I say what I want. <laughs> and I was like, okay, now it's going to be uh, very tough. He's going to, yeah. to yell at me. And he said, what did you say? That's very good. I like this idea, that's your mouth. And you say what you, yeah. what you want and never yeah. forget that. And when he died, he told me, never forget about your mouth, and I think he was right. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's terrific, thank you. Um, well, I want to, um, if there's any other questions, and okay, one more, Natasha, just, yeah. Yeah, yeah, quick question. Um, yeah. So when we think about the world of nannying or domestics here, we often think about the intersection of class and race, and what's so interesting in your book is the nanny is white in Miriam, I and mean, there's very little scant reference to Miriam's ethnicity or background except in the first few pages. And I'm curious if you, and you constantly refer to the nanny as white throughout the text, and, and yet, Miriam's ethnicity or race is not mentioned uh, as a point of you know, interest. And I'm curious about your choice be behind that and what your thoughts were about that. You know, um I like to make very glances, glancing references to identity with a very ironic tone because I don't think that we are defined by our identity because actually I don't know what is identity. Do you, are, I am incapable of telling you what I am. I can tell you what I do. I can tell you what I want to be. I can t tell you what I think, what, I am, what are my convictions, but I don't care about what I am. What I, th I think that the most important is what I do. So for me, identity is not a very interesting topic. So I like to, to laugh about it in my books, but also I like to, the idea that literature is here to tell us that reality is much more complex than what we see in the media or what we read every day. I think that literature is here to tell us that life is not about cliché and about caricature and that sometimes immigrants are rich and sometimes white people are nannies or are, um, you know, uh, are poor. And it's very important to, to get out of those figures that immigrants are always poor and white people are always rich because this is not reality. 
And also it was a way, the fact that Louise is white, it was a way to emphasize her loneliness, to emphasize her humiliation too, because she's doing a job of immigrant. And she, it's demeaning for her. And she feels it as a humiliation. And when she goes to the park, she sees all those nannies and the nannies goes together, the Africans together, the Maghrebis together, the Philippines together, and she is the only white nanny. And everyone sees her. Everyone sees his, her loneliness. And that's terrible for her because she is the wet white nanny. Hmm. Anything else? And then uh, I think we should give Layla a break before, uh, <laughs> before there's a whole other series of, of questions. Okay, quick question. Betsy? Question. I yeah. just want to comment by you because it just yeah. evolves. It is just such a good read. It, it is um, a fantastic book. So I mostly wanted to thank you because the story is gripping. And I told everyone here when they take their book home, if they start it tonight, they will not sleep. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> when I told you that I received so much love. Yeah. Oh. Thank you. Oh, well, thank well, you so much. Well, I'm also a Spanish speaking country, and I'm in Paris the entire vacation. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I cannot stop. <laughs> and you know, the other day I was in the subway and a woman was reading my book and she was like this. And then she did that because she was going out and she said, oh, she's so mean. She was, oh my God. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> <laughs> that was very funny. And I have a picture of her like this. <laughs> That's great. That's great. Well, thank you for taking Thank you. The time. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. Thank you all for coming and for your Thank you. Work.